Passiamo in questa seconda parte della mattinata alla prospettiva relativa al patrimonio, una prospettiva patrimoniale in senso legato alle discipline della storia dell'architettura, alla storia dell'arte. Il nostro primo relatore è Thomas Comans, professore di storia dell'architettura e di conservazione all'Università Cattolica di Lovagno, che ormai da molti anni frequenta questo tema, muovendo dall'ambito canadese, belga, poi con uno sguardo europeo e internazionale. Recentemente si sta interessando di patrimonio ecclesiastico in terre di missioni, in Cina, dove insegna negli ultimi anni, ed è certamente la voce più autorevole che potremo sentire su questo ambito storico-architettonico e del restauro, e lo ringrazio. Se è possibile abbassare alcuni faretti per poter vedere le immagini, chi gestisce le luci. I first uh, ask you to excuse me to speak in English. Uh, it was not very obvious which language it was. Could have done it in French. But I thank you very much for your invitation, very kind invitation, and uh, to give me the opportunity to uh, present uh, uh, work I've done since, uh, since many years. So, the origins of the present issue of uh, decommissioned churches and monasteries go back to the 1960s and the 1970s. Church redundancy developed simultaneously in Western Europe and North America, in the Catholic Church as well as in the Anglican and Lutheran churches and most of other Christian denominations. The main reason, as we know, is the evolution of the Western societies that impacts both church attendance and religious vocations. Since 50 years, churches tried to adapt to the changing Western society. But the great trends about aging attendance and shrinking vocations give the issue of church buildings redundancy huge proportions. Since 2008, an acceleration of the phenomenon is clearly visible due to the combination of three crises. The economic crisis that has boosted the cost of maintenance, the Western social identity crisis combined with new form of social relationships and media, and the institutional crisis within the various Christian denominations. Today, no Western religion is not confronted with the issue and its consequences on use, maintenance, financing, ownership, and heritage. What can we learn from half a century experiences with redundant churches? I will not present lists of individual cases or show a selection of individual best practices. There are enough websites, books, and awards about this, which use more or less critical criteria. I will reflect on different forms on adaptive reuse of church buildings, changing heritage values, and new models of decision making that could be useful for the future. My thoughts will conclude with five statements. I will not discuss the churches and other places of worship that still fulfill their original functions and still have a liturgical use. That is the ideal situation. My question is, what should, could, and can happen to churches that have lost their original use? This question is much more than a spiritual question, but it includes legal, economic, social, cultural, and even political dimensions because it affects the complex relationship between the church and the society. Who is the owner? What are the rights and the duties of the owner and the user? 
Who decides whether a church should be decommissioned, reused, or, dem or demolished? Are there alternative forms of use? What are the consequences of heritage protection on the reuse of a church? What should happen to the movable heritage? All these questions receive different answers in each country according to the relations between church and state. Furthermore, there are societal debates with sometimes very diverse and extreme opinions. From the point of view of architectural heritage, that is my point of view, architectural heritage conservation, the core of the problem concerns the use of churches and is based on a functional approach. Some people believe that churches that lost their original function are threatened to be used as nightclubs or mosques and should therefore be demolished rather than be profaned. Such excessive and polarizing approach based on exceptional cases, fortunately, does not contribute to a serene debate. My approach concerns the heritage dimension of churches and show that there are num numerous possibilities for redeveloping churches. Church buildings are highly valuable heritage that requires a specific care. According to Olivier de Rohan, president of Future for Religious Heritage, here present, the European Network of Historic Places of Worship, I quote, churches are the largest museum of Europe, but paradoxically, often the most neglected heritage. Precise statistics about the commissioned churches and monasteries are difficult to obtain, but it concerns appalling numbers. In Germany, for example, about 15,000 of about the 45,000 parish churches are no more in use. Heritage, public interest, and use value. Often, it is only when somebody disappears that we realize how valuable he or she was to us. The same is true for buildings and heritage. For this reason, governments can prevent the loss of heritage and have legal possibilities to protect monuments and other cultural relics. A protection of a heritage relic, of a heritage building, is like a canonization. Based on values, a heritage building is declared exceptional. Its interest shifts from the private to the public, and tourists will come to admire it like worshipping pilgrims. Protection is thus an important decision with important consequences. In order to qualify for protection, the general interest of the relic must be proven on the basis of values described by the law. The methodology of heritage experts consists of gathering the knowledge needed to assess the heritage values. Values are evaluated with criteria, including authenticity, integrity, rarity, etc. As houses of God, churches have a rich significance in the public space as structuring beacons of rural and urban landscapes, as well as symbolic and often ancient identifiers for local communities. Therefore, churches are particularly remarkable buildings for which the heritage value assessment implies different complementary perspectives. Specific attention is paid on the architecture, on the interior, on the historical context, on the spatial context, time and space, as well as to the expressions of the intangible or at immaterial dimensions. 
The results of such systematic approaches shows how great the diversity of church buildings is. For centuries, they have contributed to form a landscape of churches. Most medieval, Renaissance, Baroque, and classic churches are protected heritage. 19th and 20th century churches, however, are much more numerous and more recent, and that is why their heritage value is more difficult to evaluate. In the 1960s and 70s, many 19th century churches were demolished and replaced with modern architecture. Today, these modern churches are threatened and often demolished when decommissioned. In some countries, post-war churches are studied and selectively protected on the base of a rational valuation methodology. But in many other places, the protection of recent heritage remains exceptional. There are also economic reasons for selective protection because restorations of protection build, protected buildings are subsidized by governments. And as we know, budget for culture and heritage policy have been cut in all our countries since 2008. Alternative sources of financing are therefore required. The fact that the church is protected or not does not change much of its use for worship. Protected churches are also closing their doors. Conversely, protection will be a decisive in the debate about the adaptive reuse of a monument. This, once again, proves how important the use value is for a building. The use value or usefulness of a monument is one of the five categories of heritage values as defined by Alois Riegel in his famous book on the origins and the essence of the modern heritage cult, Denkmal Kultus, 1903. In this theoretical essay, Riegel distinguishes two categories of values, the memorial values on the one hand, consisting on the value of antiquity, something is ancient, old, the historical value and the commemorative value. And on the other hand, the current values consisting on the art value and the use value. Riegel thus makes a clear distinction between the spiritual dimension of art or aesthetic value and the practical dimension of the use value. Except for ruins that mainly have an aesthetic value, the use value is a decisive factor in the preservation of monuments. Not only churches, but numerous other buildings have been confronted with similar transformations. In theory, adaptive reuse, subject to conditions, is therefore possible and, desir and desirable in practice. Churches have been often reused in a purely functional perspective. During the religious wars of the 16th century, around 1800 after the French Revolution, in anti-clerical states during the 19th century or after Second World War in communist Central European countries, thousands of churches and monasteries were decommissioned. Without any heritage considerations, they were relocate, reallocated to warehouses, barns, barracks, prisons, schools, hospitals, industrial buildings, etc. The immediate usefulness or use value was the only criteria for not demolishing these buildings and selling their building materials. One could say that in Europe, there is a long tradition of relocating religious buildings for which four main scenarios could be distinguished. A religious or ideological reallocation, a abandonment or destruction with a ruin, pragmatic and profi profane reallocations and also reallocations that included heritage considerations, notably for cultural functions. Two scenarios could be combined, such as a partial demolition or a partial reuse. And some churches and monasteries 
today world heritage, like Mont Saint-Michel or the Fontenay Abbey, hmm, survived the 19th century only because they served as a paper factory and a prison. It is indeed in the context of the French Revolution as a result of the blind devastation of heritage and works of art in churches that the modern heritage awareness originated. The success of a redevelopment project for a church is partially due to the good cooperation between the various stakeholders. Finding a suitable future for a church building is not the work of experts and clergymen only. A church building has a different signification for different groups, and each of these significations can be important and should be preserved when possible. Moreover, a new use can add a new significance to a building, which has influence on these groups. For a good solution, one must therefore take into account the views of all people involved. It is therefore desirable to bring all stakeholders together from the start. A widely used method is to set up a non-profit organization that cares about the future of certain church buildings. People from all groups of stakeholders can work together on a project, raise money and possibly manage the building once the building has been completed. In the Netherlands and in Quebec, two countries that have a long experience in the field, complex models of partnerships have been experienced with a certain success. Of course, the role of the church in the process is essential. Sometimes the church is an owner, but sometimes the church is only the user of the church building. But there are always clear legal rules and agreement about parish churches. So for the Roman Catholic Church, the profane use of a church is possible as long as it is not unworthy and does not cause any damage to spiritual welfare. For Catholic parish churches, the diocesan bishop has an important decision-making role. On the one hand, he must contribute to the adaptation of centuries-old dominating Christianity to the new multicultural and religious society. The church strives for a different image, but a vacant, closed, and dilapidated churches certainly do not contribute to a positive face of the church. On the other hand, in function of local pastoral and ecclesiastical considerations, the bishop must think of alternative designations together with the municipal authorities. Unlike Protestant churches, Catholic churches and chapels are consecrated buildings, <coughs> meaning that the bishop takes the final decision in accordance with the church law, the Codex Ius Canonicis, Canon 1222. Some bishops opt for the scenario of mixed use and religious presence in a small part of the building, while other bishops prefer the scenario of desecration and disposition, disposing of building. In the case of mixed use, the preference of the church goes to the profane and locally embedded customs with a social and cultural character. The current terminology about redesignation of vacant and underused churches make a distinction between different scenarios around two major options in function of the survival or disappearance of religious use. The first big category is when religious use is maintained but with another focus. It could be a reorientation, as for example, the columbary churches. By a community, it could be reused by a community of another religious denomination, that is reuse, or by several religious, different religious communities together, shared use, sharing the space at different times. Or it could be combined with another destination, kind of co-use, which is very popular today. And the church can be also divided spatially, or only can be shared in time, which is then a polyvalent space. 
The second big category is when the religious use disappears and the church is decommissioned. In this case, the building should receive a new destination, which for Catholic churches implies a desecration or deconsecration. Different scenarios are also possible here, ranging from private use to semi-public use and public use with cultural purpose. In countries with a long experience in the reuse of churches, a critical evaluation of the phenomenon is possible today. The complete privatization and division into offices and apartments appears to be one of the worst solutions because these churches lose their public character and their spa spatial quality. The interests of the real estate market are based on the optimization of square meters, but church spaces mainly consist of cubic meters. Event halls and sport halls respect the inner space of churches, but imply the complete emptying of the interior and renovation for the design of infrastructure, sanitary, changing rooms, kitchens, etc. Therefore, it would be thought that public cultural use is the most respectful and appropriate use. We hear that this morning. However, it does not seem to be the case. The requirements of museums regarding safety, light, and climate control are difficult to reconcile, to reconcile with large church spaces. Theater halls, concert halls, and cultural centers require heavy and extensive infrastructure modifications and spa spatial techniques such as stage technologies, air conditioning, seats and gradins, cloak rooms, foyers, cafeterias. Designing a totally new building is therefore cheaper and most efficient than a reuse. Libraries are probably the most obvious reuse, but heating or cooling big spaces of poorly insulated churches raise the exploitation costs. In most cases, the contents of churches are also an obstacle, the old pews in the nave, for example, and they have to be moved in the building to another destination. Multifunctional reuse and shared use appears to offer more opportunities for sustainable solutions than monofunctional use. When a monofunctional reuse is economically unprofitable, the building is returned to the market and enters a negative spiral of emptiness and new transformations that result in a gradual loss of values and qualities. This is a particularly true in the case of stores that never live very long. After several transformations, nothing is left of the original interiors. Conversely, when a church combines different functions and is used by different partners, the chains of vacancy of the whole building is much smaller. It is therefore methodologically very important to make a good analysis of the morphology of the each individual church in order to find the way to divide their space according to their morphology and so to define smaller spaces that have a spatial quality. In such cases, it is suitable that the different users sign a charter with which they commit to common house rules as well as the respect of the building spirit, which includes heritage. Bringing together a multidisciplinary team is important in order to map the different aspects and potentialities of church buildings. The experts, heritage consultants, historians, building archaeologists, architects, engineers, etc., can decide from their experience which surveys will be needed to assess the heritage values. Once the values determined, they are also the best representatives of these values. In addition, they can use their experience when determining suitable alternative views in similar projects. 
In addition to the architectural, urban, and historical values of a church, the use and existence values must also be taken into account. In other words, what does the church mean to the society today? Each individual can assign certain values to the building on the subjective basis of how he or she uses or experiences the church building. Even for those who do not actually use the church, the church often has a symbolic value as a landmark in landscape. In Western countries, the church stands for the identity of neighborhood and village community, the church tower syndrome. This collective experience means that the mere existence of a church can be very valu valuable to a community. Because of these considerations, it is important to involve the neighborhood's community in the development process, preferably as early as possible. Due to the crisis conditions, the scale and the lack of means and vision, neither the government or the church denominations are able to keep the problem of the use of churches under their full control. The collaboration of church, state, and people could lead to case-by-case -case solutions within a global vision. That is why the process a future for the Flemish parish church in Belgium is rather unique. In 2011, the Flemish government placed the problem of the use and financing of parish churches on the political agenda. For the first time, it resulted in a dialogue with the representatives of the church, the church fabrics, the municipalities, heritage and local associations. The intention is to outline a future perspective, in particular, the parish plan, which will have to decide which churches will eventually be used for worship and which churches may be fully or partially decommissioned and reused. This political vision has important consequences for the church fabrics and the municipalities, partially because it will define the framework of the future financing for the maintenance and the restorations of the buildings. The minister has entrusted the Center for Religious Art and Culture, CRKC, here present, with the task of developing a center of expertise for built ecclesiastical heritage. In parallel, the five Flemish dioceses are in the process of drafting management and policy plans with a view to the selection of church buildings, dialogue with church fabrics, and guidelines for the valorization and the alternative use of church buildings. In Flanders too, the CADOC, Documentation and Research Center on Religion, Culture, and Society, founded in 1976 at the Catholic University of Leuven, has become the sanctuary for more than 30 kilometer archives and libraries of religious institutes and Christian society in Belgium. Both the CRKC and CADOC are located in reused religious buildings. Finally, each church closure is an individual case that needs an ad hoc approach. Church closures mobilize citizens who are willing to commit because their church means something, often very emotionally, to them. Such participatory models concern new forms of heritage awareness and heritageization. I'm not sure about the Italian translation, sorry for that. In a bottom-up dynamic that makes extensive use of the new social media. They, often alternative, they offer alternative and complementary input to the traditional top-down decision of experts, churches, and states. Heritageization, or heritage making, is a process whereby a building, or a site, or an object, or intangible practice is gradually considered as heritage. The heritageization of churches is based on the shift from the sacred spiritual value of religion to the sacred cultural value of heritage, which are not antithetical, but partially overlapping and certainly 
complementary. However, this distinction between religious and secular seems to be a condition for the broad societal support that church buildings need to survive in a de-Christianized world. This applies to both protected and non-protected buildings. A growing number of people consider heritage and churches as commons that should benefit collectively according to new governance mechanism based on non-private ownership. This last decade, num numerous non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and non-profit organizations, NPOs, have emerged with the aim of saving religious, religious immovable and movable heritage. These are some examples. The forms, specific objectives, resources, member profile, etc., of these organizations are very diverse, ranging from small associations of friends of an individual church to trusts that, ha that are owners of dozens of churches, charities specializing in fundraising, regional associations, inner church heritage networks government subsidized associations, etc., etc. In Europe, we have about 600,000 places of worship, not all Catholic. Churches, cathedrals, temples, mosques, synagogues, etc. Most with a long history, a high heritage values, and a rich artistic content. In 2011, the international network Future for Religious Heritage, the European Network for Historic Places of Worship, was founded with the aim of promoting, encouraging, and supporting the safeguard, maintenance, valorization, and use of places of worship, as well as their content and history. FRH is the only European network of charities, government departments, religious associations, and academic departments that works for the protection of religious immovable and movable heritage throughout Europe. This non-profit organization is open to everyone and all religions and benefits from European cooperation. FRH is established as a platform for local association, top-down, and a voice tube towards the European Union, bottom-up. Time to conclude. There is no doubt that alternative use, shared use, and adaptive reuse of churches will increase significantly in the coming years in Western Europe and North America. Thanks to bottom-up mobilization, heritageization, and innovation, church buildings are a heritage with a future. Five conclusions can be formulated briefly here. First, the demolition of a church, which is a building with a high symbolic and cultural value, is always an important and irreversible loss of heritage and identity for whole the society. Second, many former places of worship the heritage value of which presently is acknowledged only exists because they have been reused once in their lifetime. Third, adaptive reuse of buildings, including churches, is a long Western tradition, presently reactivated by heritage awareness and new challenges such as sustainable development and commons. Fourth, public reuse with a socio-cultural character is more suitable and appropriate than privatization of a redundant place of worship. And five, mixed use or shared use, local uses, including religious use, are most promising for the future. They involve the participation of local people and imply a changing of methods and mentalities. They are a challenge for the church 
and the heritage sector and would contribute to a more tolerant society. I thank you.